Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Afghanistan by Afghans, where you get to meet some amazing Afghans. There you go. I said amazing again. Uh, I've been accused of using the word amazing a lot to describe my guests, but it goes really well with Afghans and you are amazing today. So I have to use it. Um, today I have with me Mina John. Mina Sharif uh, lives in Toronto, has a fascinating life story, which I just learned just a little bit of. And then I'm like, oh, we got to record this and have it, you know, on camera. Um, being born in um, Toronto and then spending a lot of time in Afghanistan. Uh, I came across her work because right after, I believe, the August incident, she has been uh, doing a little bit of podcast with a friend of hers, which we'll get to learn probably more about uh, on Instagram. Uh, are they called podcasts if it's on Instagram or is it Insta Live? It's, it's, it's actually uh, headed in that direction to be considered that as well. So Oh, wonderful. It, it, okay. it's, it's, it'll always be available on Instagram. Always. Instagram That's live, great. Once a week. So that's how I came across her work. Um, these really in-depth conversations uh, that really touches on a lot of issues, but also touches the heart as well. Uh, that's kind of something I, I, I experienced when listening to a few episodes. So without further ado, Mina John, welcome. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Eid Mubarak to you, by the way. Oh, yes. You know, you dated the show. If I'm going to put this, this, this on in a month, people will know we, well, we recorded it on... Eat. Monday, have, May 2nd. Okay. Who's, who's to say which Eid? We have plenty of them. That's true. That's true. That's true. More than one a year. That's so true. That's very true. So uh, then maybe I'll, you know, save it and then release it next Eid a year from now, you know. <laughs> um, so Mina John, let's start by kind of um, talking about your family's journey from Afghanistan to Canada. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. So, uh, sure, going back actually to the introduction, I was actually not born in Canada. I was born in Afghanistan. Um, oh, okay. And um, I was present as my parents uh, were forced to flee. I, I would say forced because it was uh, a situation where they didn't want to leave, but had um, reason to believe that for their own safety they had to. Uh, so my parents fled and there was the whole process of some time in Pakistan and some time in India. And, um, I was pretty young still when we reached Canada. I was only three or four years old. So I have essentially grown up here. Um, I don't really share too much of that story, not because of any particular reason, but I just feel like I don't own that story. That's my parents' story. When you're, when you're an infant or a, or a young kid, I don't Think that you carry the story or the trauma of it in the same uh, with the same weight and um unfortunately now as a an adult i have experienced the the same heartaches myself so i i can update you on how i experienced leaving afghanistan again um but my my family did arrive in canada and um we spent uh, we have a very good uh safe happy life here um i was quite satisfied with that but I went to Afghanistan in 2005, thinking that I would stay for six months, but I stayed until 2019. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and what you mentioned is you you went for some consultancy. Tell us a little bit of some of the some of the projects you were involved with there. Sure. Well, I mean, how I got there was not. Uh, I don't think one of the common uh, narratives, which was, you know, it was always my dream to go. It was, sure, it was my dream to see Afghanistan, but I knew it as a place that you could not even visit because it wasn't mm -hmm. safe enough to. And I was, um, you know, studying television, radio, broadcast. It really didn't link to my life in, in many ways. I did hope one day I could visit, but uh, it really it, it wasn't in my periphery. I didn't study international relations. I didn't uh, um, even really feel a big longing. I thought it was just not meant uh, for me to experience. I thought that's just, I didn't have that chance. I certainly didn't think that radio or television or those kind of studies would take me to Afghanistan, <laughs> but that's how it happened. I actually um, was working on a radio program designed for Afghan youth in Toronto. Um, and it was essentially working with a lot of kids who were dealing with uh, different issues, whether it was trouble with the law, mental health issues, um, things like that. And we developed a radio show that sort of 
di was directed at the Afghan diaspora. It was um, broadcast in English, Betty and Pastro together. All each host spoke a different language. It was <laughs> pretty awkward, but it was fun. Um, and while I was doing that show, which received really good feedback because the diaspora is so rarely addressed. Um, while I was working on that show, I got word of a volunteer opportunity in Afghanistan to do um, six months volunteer work in working with women managed radio stations throughout Af Afghanistan. Um, and my parents said, oh, that's wonderful. And then they started as, when when the job was coming closer, they said, yeah, six months sounds kind of long. And they started to worry and and encouraged me to sort of turn that down and said, we'll go and visit them. Now that the seed has been planted and you want to see Afghanistan, then we'll go another time. But when I found out that I was the only Afghan volunteering and that all the other volunteers were non-Afghan, that was um, that was the breaking point for me. There was no way I could turn it down. I had to show up. So mm -hmm. I didn't speak any Betty. I spoke only broken Pashto in English, but um, I, I decided that I had to go. So that's how I got to uh, Afghanistan. And I really did expect that it would be six months because there, it, there was a cap of six mm -hmm. months for volunteering. Um, but once I arrived there, besides all the emotion and besides mm -hmm. all the connection that I felt, I also realized that a six month turnaround makes no sense because it takes that long to really just begin to understand um, the environment. And I don't mean the day to day, but I mean, uh, we were re rebuilding a lot that had been that had been really the structure had been damaged for so long that we had mm -hmm. to rebuild and, um, how things were um, put together, how people were interacting as far as um, it, media specifically, I'm talking about where we were kind of starting from scratch for someone to come in for six months and then just be gone. And then the new person to come in and then a, that revolving door, I didn't want to be part of the revolving door. I wanted to really be part of the story. So I, mm -hmm. I stayed, I stayed a very long time. <laughs> you stayed a very long <laughs> to time. My to my family's demise. Yes. How long did you stay in, in total? Uh, nearly 15 years. Um, oh, wow. In, 2000, so... in 2019, I, I returned. I, I didn't even officially return. I came to Canada expecting to stay six weeks. Uh, I had a ticket to go back. Uh, and then a few minor personal things happened. But in addition to that, then COVID happened. And every couple of months, I thought, let's start planning to go back. And then, of course, after August 15th, it was no longer mm -hmm. a viable option. Had COVID not happened and you were there, you would be one of the people trying to get evacuated, possibly, right? I mean, that would have quite, uh, Yeah, things could have gone very different for me. Very but, different. Um, yeah, it's a pretty unique situation for myself. I mean, yeah. when you talk about the, the, the less important things, you know, yeah. like our material things in life, like our clothes and shoot, all of my things are there. So that mm -hmm. <laughs> originally hurt me so much, but uh, yeah. you know, I was so lucky in the end because I, I left on on such on such casual yeah. terms, really not knowing yeah. what was coming. Yeah, I mean, fifteen years. Uh, I, I have another friend. I mean, there's so many other Afghans have also kind of spent all their uh, a lot of a lot of their heart and blood and sweat trying to rebuild the country. Uh, I don't know if that was, of course, probably potentially your purpose of going back as well. This one friend specifically went back and has, I've, I won't read their, their name, but has spent about, you know, right after the, the U.S. Uh, went there, he went there as well, okay? And uh, he'd spent a lot of effort and, <laughs> and trying to basically, uh, you know, try invest it basically emotionally, as well as through finance and all, all their work as well. Um, but... And after he was one of the people who was came back during COVID as well, he felt a huge letdown and has and has gone into a, a very different state mentally of investing about 20, in his case, I think it's about 18 years um, of his life, uh, you know, with, with the U.S. trying to reestablish things and everything is gone. And uh, he's at a very different state emotionally. Um, for you spending 15 years, I, which I did not know it was this long, what was your feeling now or was at that moment or now even at this, at this moment, uh, how do you feel having spent 15 uh, years of your life there? Well, 
I think my reaction is very different from your friend who I probably know, by the way, <laughs> just by just by by definition of having uh, the American background and being there that long. But um, I I didn't work necessarily on the U.S. mission or the international mission. I, I worked a lot with Afghan organizations and I that happened really quickly in my time there. So what also happened really quickly in my time was sort of a, a disconnect and a um, disillusionment of really the, the necessity for the international presence in the way that it was. Meaning I understood the value of, um, for example, donors coming in and, and, and helping uh, uplift existing Afghan projects, but that rarely happened. The, the misspending and the, and the lack of sustainability and these kind of things really did um, impact me in a way that I, uh, year after year after year, went more and more in the direction of, of supporting and working with Afghan entrepreneurs versus, uh, versus organizations that were um, internationally, uh, based, uh, from the international community and basing themselves in Afghanistan. I never did work for you know the UN or World Bank or anywhere like that. And uh, I, I guess I thought about it at, at different points because it would have probably been nice to have a, the salaries that go with that but at the same time I don't walk away regretting uh, regretting it because I got a, a very um, mm -hmm. a very real experience I wasn't locked away in a compound I didn't have a lot of security restrictions I lived in a regular house you know had a regular front yard and that that meant a lot to me because I got to experience different facets which doesn't mean that I didn't have interaction with uh, embassies and um, mm -hmm and consulates and all of that. I absolutely did. That came with almost all of the work that was going on there. You had some kind of interaction with. That's wonderful. So you feel that yeah. your work and time, so you feel your, like your work and time there uh, and what you achieved kind of stays back, even though with the current situation going on? Um, well, I didn't do the same thing for the entire time I was there. So I'll say that first. It was a lot of different uh, projects. projects. Yeah. Some of them came, some of them went. Um, but for example, the last organization I worked with, uh, one of the things we did was founded a uh, mentorship program for women and girls. Um, and it was, it, it came from wanting to just encourage a little more um, self-worth and self-confidence in an environment that focused on them as women and girls. And that program is still running as we speak. It's not, uh, it's very grassroots. And when it's very grassroots, right, it's not right. depending on a lot of different organizations to find it. It's just, it's just a community that was built. And so they're all still in touch. They're all um, still, you know, doing whatever they can to encourage the girls with learning. Um, even when they're not able to be in school, they're in touch with each other. Um, so yeah, I think the smaller the projects were in this past, time uh, and the more organically that they that they were created uh, they were always when you when you were only given a small amount of support you made your program sustainable you didn't mm -hmm. make it so that you would have to ask for money again next year and again next year and again next year so some of those small projects are i'm proud to say are still running that's wonderful that's great <laughs> that's wonderful uh, a lot a lot of the conversations i do have are from people you know, feeling disillusioned and, and let down. So this is so wonderful to hear your story and to hear that some of the projects or most of them that you've been with uh, are, are self-sustaining uh, even to this day. Um, I know there's one organization, um, Le Learn Afghanistan. Is, are you involved with that one? Or there's uh, a few ones that are doing educations uh, that are still like operating to this day? Yes. Actually, right. Learn, um, I am an ambassador for Learn, which is run by the incredible Pashtana Durrani, who I was friends with before, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, before everything happened as well. And um, everyone's had to adapt. It's not like everything was so incredibly in intact that nothing could phase them. For sure, everyone's been shaken, but a lot of things are able to slowly get back on their feet, depend regardless of the new circumstances. Of course, the laws and new announcements come every five minutes. So it's hard to mm -hmm. say what will last even a week from now. I'm, and I don't mean to imply that these projects are all flourishing, but they're managing to stay alive. And we're hoping that they continue to grow. Um, and 
you know, I wouldn't even say that I'm not disillusioned. I just think my disillusionment began so much earlier than August 15th that I'm not in as as much uh, a shock. different kind of disillusion. Yeah, maybe the yeah. shock of, of things not lasting isn't really, um, it's not really new to me. Yeah, yeah, it's not shocking. Yeah, that aspect of it is not shocking because you're there. So what are some, I mean, for, for somebody like yourself who's kind of been there, what do you think are some of the missing points and conversations that are happening about Afghanistan? Uh, I'm sure there are so many points that are um, not on target, but what do you think are some of the common mistargeted sort of points that are being talked about Afghanistan, whether in U.S. or international media or Afghan media um, that, you, yeah, that you think are not on target? I, I have a million opinions. On yeah, I'm sure there's opinions. millions of them. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say that unfortunately, everybody across the board is guilty of not listening to Afghans themselves that live and breathe and, and are full time in Afghanistan. This includes the international community and uh, has all, they've always been that way. Uh, this includes the media just in general has always been that way. But this also includes the Afghan diaspora, and I mean all generations of Afghan diaspora who have decided um, to really jump up ahead a bunch of steps so that they are um, part of the conversation, which means they're discussing um, ethnic uh, divide or what, how the country should be reshaped. And this is not me dispelling any of those ideas. This is me wondering how that could possibly be a priority discussion when the current state of Afghanistan is far from deciding how to um, reestablish a government. We are far from even having one. So mm -hmm. I really do wish that if people, uh, I feel that if people listened a little more closely to what Afghans on the ground are saying, they would much rather we use our energy right now, which is not to say any of that is not important. It's very important that we, uh, in my opinion, dismantle how systems were operating and start from scratch but not right now. First, we need to concentrate on, on the population that's still there. We need to concentrate on getting support to them. We need to concentrate on, um, uh, on getting support for those, for the ANA and the ANP that were, that were deserted um, on the, the violence that's happening, the genocide that's happening. These are all really immediate. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. because of that, that failure to listen, some people are 20 steps ahead. Some people are just sort of talking about their own sadness and grief. Other people are uh, media is talking to random people in different countries about Afghanistan, but very few stop and say, let's just have a conversation with people in Afghanistan, a regular person, and they're available. If they're talking to me, they'll talk to, to others as well. They're available even on Twitter, or even on Facebook, you, you can, but people don't pause and think, should I guess what Afghanistan needs right now? Or should I ask Afghans themselves who are living in, uh, mm -hmm. in Afghanistan? Yeah, of course, of course. That's a good one. Uh, now you're on a roll. What is another one <laughs> that comes to mind? <laughs> well, I mean, that's it. I try to just generalize it. I think if we listened, for example, right. we'd under we wouldn't be confused about the schooling situation. We mm -hmm. know that that's uh, we know that it's a mismatch religiously. We know that the argument is a failure. Uh, the argument of stopping it just doesn't hold any merit. But instead of just guessing and just saying random things, you talk to Afghan, uh, Afghan women, Afghan school teachers, they'll tell you. They're very mm -hmm. willing to speak. Um, also, uh, we, would, we wouldn't be as confused about what necessarily happened with the army and did they really deserve right. anybody. I feel like it takes minimal listening and minimal research to see what really happened. But everyone, uh, I understood for a month, everyone reacting emotionally. I understood for two months and six months, but we're quite a long way down now. And um, people are still not pausing to listen to what really happened um, and forget about what really happened, but really what right. is needed right now. Right, right. The short term, you're, you're more concerned about the short term and what can happen, what we can, uh, how we can offer support and help in the short run is, is I think your focus is what you're referring to. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, and I there are individuals. No, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just saying on, on that point, I think we all like intellectually, we know that this is an emergency in Afghanistan. Yeah. But when we discuss Afghanistan, we don't treat it as an emergency. Yes. A lot, right. of, a lot of diaspora or whoever else talks in a very sort of abstract ways about this, this future that isn't here yet. Yes. First, what we need to do is make sure everyone gets 
food. We need to make sure that people are safe. We need to make sure that this uh, current, uh, whatever we want to call them, I, I believe they are an occupation, but we need to make sure that they're held accountable for all these people who are under their control. They mm-hmm. need to be uh, banned from traveling to other countries rather than, but what they, what they won't be because the narrative coming from so many places is confusing. Right, uh, right. And yeah. it's only confusing because we're not listening to Afghans themselves. That's right. Oh, that's right. Um, now, going to your uh, podcast and starting your, you know, doing live shows, what was kind of the inspiration? Was all of this the inspiration behind it? You wanted to share all of this? Uh, tell us a little about how that got started. So funny enough, um, when I was, I would say, uh, very early into, not very early, but maybe five years ago, six years ago, I started uh, writing op-eds and started just sort of putting this message out that people were failing to um, recognize the realities in Afghanistan, meaning I didn't think people saw the real positive side of Afghanistan. I was concerned with how belittled we were with the headlines that um, dismissed Afghanistan as, as just violent and confusing and money misspent. But what about the real successes and the real day-to-day life? And so I started doing that while I was still in Afghanistan. It wasn't, it wasn't, this is not a August 15th reaction. And the same with uh, the Instagram lives that I do with Shamayo Solizi. That we started before, um, mm-hmm. a few months prior to August 15th. We, we both had lived in Afghanistan for a good amount of years of our lives. And we both recognized that there was a massive disconnect um, between the rest of the world, but particularly the diaspora, because um, without trying to sound rude, I don't care that much what the rest of the world thinks, but it matters a lot to me that Afghans themselves are connected to where they're from and their identity. It's a whole different conversation. Mm -hmm. Uh, It would be lovely if the media understood us better and respected us better, but it doesn't matter as much as we ourselves knowing where we come from and really in-depth understanding that it's not just a story of war and violence and sadness. So that was the motivation. Um, And we had conversations with each other and decided we need to, we need to um, share this with others because it's going to help the healing process. Mm -hmm. And we, if we're not healed with that country, then we're not going to know how to, how to do it better next time. And we're not going to know, um, what needs to change and what need, what we need to preserve. Um, and more than that, just even on a personal level, each one of us deserves to have that connection because it's a beautiful connection to have. Mm-hmm. And if you're depending on only headlines, they're so negative. And if you have mm-hmm. your parents' stories and headlines only, then you're looking at stories that are like 20, 30, 40 years old, plus some headlines. That's a really sad yeah. um you know, that's a really sad, uh, limited source of information. And so we were mm. just trying to fill that gap. Yeah, yeah, definitely. One thing I loved about it is that you are trying to kind of peel and go into layers and have multitudes of layers to the concept of identity, um, which which I, in many ways is, you know, it's a personal journey as well. I think it's mm-hmm. like you're trying to connect the individual journey with the collective journey of who we are. Uh, as people and it's it's a both so people have to be ready to to also dig into themselves if you also want to dig in in the collective identity as well right so you're asking for a lot of personal you know which a lot of people are not ready to be self-reflective and such and a lot of people in diaspora also that kind of went in this past 20 years trying to go and help in in some way um also kind of lived in a very sheltered a compound of experience in Afghanistan is a very and plus uh, the, the the foreigners who went there as well, right? We're talking about uh, compounds that are heavily military, and we're phys- we're talking about physical compounds, you know. Yes. Um, and it has a very limited. You have a very limited experience of going out and uh, and all of that, and 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 then so there's you know so then you kind of probably create a very exclusive internal compound and culture which probably re just uh, you reverberate whatever others are feeling and such. So it's, it's a very, I, I, I don't know what the word would be is like when you're having a very isolated experience uh, in a place where everything is going on around you. Um, oh gosh. Yeah. You know, anyway, you, that's you really, that's really insightful of you. That's hard for people to, um, to imagine from a distance normally. And, 
I mean, I shudder to think if I had only done that six months and then decided that I yeah, you would be on yeah. in any way. And I wasn't living in a compound even in that six months, but I visited compounds. And it, this is not to devalue their experience, but I think it's a far cry from having an actual, um, an actual experience of, of the Afghan day-to-day -day life. You absolutely didn't. I mean, a lot of people will tell you that whoever they met was coming in from the from the outside, <laughs> mm -hmm. that crazy world called, uh, you know, civilian world or whatever they called it. Um, you know, you have interaction with people from that part of society. And that's all fair to say, but you are so guarded and they're a different person when they're in the compound too. This is their, a job to them. When you meet someone at work, you're not meeting that person as they mm -hmm. are at home. That's, that's an easy equation. Everybody knows that. So Mm -hmm. At the same time, too, we have uh, uh, Afghans who have gone to visit family. And sure, you've gone to visit your family, but that is also, I, I, can, I can't even say that in the 15 years that I have anywhere, um, that I have the, the authority or the agency to say that I have lived a full Afghan life. I don't even think one person from one province can say that they speak for all of uh, Afghan life. Because if you grew up in Jalalabad, then you don't know what Herat life mm -hmm. is like, unless you've mm -hmm. gone and lived there for a long time as well. So we all have our own lens and we all have our own perspective, but I think taking accountability for how limited your access was is not your fault that you were, that your access is limited because all of our accesses are limited to some degree. But mm -hmm. when you're diaspora and you were born and raised outside, you were limited to a massive degree to headlines mm -hmm. and old stories. And this isn't meant to be uh, a pay it forward gift and it's for you to do what you want with it it's not to say this is what you lack in and that's what you lack in but if you're willing to take accountability and address not even accountability but to face and um, accept that your access is limited then there's a lot of room to grow through hearing stories that we share through oh, all we really want to do is spark your interest in a new way mm -hmm. and then go find out for yourself hopefully one day or ask different kind of questions when you meet Afghans who come, uh, you know, who have come more recently or who will continue to come, you'll be mm -hmm. equipped. You'll, you'll know what to ask. You'll want to know more, but in a more real everyday kind of way. I think someone who lived in a compound for five years should go ask those people questions too, because they didn't really see much of, of the country. Yeah, I know. That's, that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, as, as we kind of, I feel like we, we should have a much longer conversation than a half hour as, as we expected. The conversation is just beginning. Maybe we'll do more more chats. <laughs> uh, but I, I kind of, as we kind of go towards uh, wrapping up and such, um, mm -hmm. what what do you think are kind of the next steps? Some immediate, tangible takeaways for audiences, both people in diaspora who are listening, as as well as uh, non Afghans who are beginning through the show to kind of. Get a get a grasp of hearing Afghan voices from themselves. That's kind of the, the whole point of why I kind of started that. Uh, what are some immediate point takeaways? Do you think that people should take away other than a listening to Afghans themselves, uh, which is the number one uh, point, which you kind of talked about more? What are some other takeaways that you would give? Um, well, you see, I don't want to assign people with a ton of homework, like go and of do course. all your research and learn. And, and I think that, the, so I'll go with the very minimal. It's a very minimal, especially as uh, Afghans in the diaspora, but really anyone who cares about what happens with Afghanistan. Um, if you could think of yourself more as an ambassador for people who are suffering, than to think about what you're going through from looking at that news, stepping out of yourself and really having a little more empathy rather than being fixated on your reaction to what is happening, which is not to say that you don't deserve to have a reaction. We all do, we're all really upset by it. But when you're very stuck in yourself and your reaction, what are you doing for anyone else? Not much. What you can do when you get into the headspace of being an ambassador is you can start to look for little ways. I'm not asking you all to donate your money, but you can learn about fundraisers, kind of research about them a little and then promote those. You can tell one or two positive stories about Afghanistan to somebody, even that is making a difference because it's a trickle effect. You cannot be a contributor to the war narrative of Afghanistan. If you do it, then who's gonna stop us from being known as just a country of war and sadness? If you're doing it too, 
then don't expect the rest of the world to to make a difference for us in that in that department. We're always going to be um, dismissed if if our own people are dismissing us. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said. You're you're talking about a step away from ego and self centrism. <laughs> this is definitely an internal journey. You're 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 <laughs> definitely asking people to go on this internal journey. Um, yeah, definitely. You're very much focused on that, and and that's beautiful. Uh, and that's that's what I had expected as well, of course, from hearing some of your conversations. So. I thank you so much for coming and having this uh, conversation with me. I really appreciate your time. Um, Likewise. Thank you for having me. Yes, of course. And best of luck. We'll put some links to your shows and, and other activities uh, that people can check out. So if you enjoyed this conversation, please uh, stick around. There's more such conversations and please give it a listen. And thank you so much, Meena John, for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Have a good one.